Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Faramy Okunlami. I lost my physical independence on July 4th, 2013. My tireless efforts to gain that back over the four plus years since then have awakened me to the struggles that my patients face every day, but that are seldom the topic of JAMA articles or board review questions. My experience has given me a mission to disabuse disability, to prove that disability does not mean inability. I was hosting a 4th of July gathering at a pool in New Haven, Connecticut, where I was a third year orthopedic surgery resident at Yale. I dove into the pool and struck something. The bottom, the side, I can't be entirely sure. And immediately was unable to move or feel anything below my neck. A friend sitting on the pool deck saw my futile efforts to emerge from the water and jumped in and rescued me from drowning. It was immediately apparent to me and to many of my friends who were there, including an assortment of surgical residents from various specialties, that I likely suffered a cervical spine injury. Putting to work our advanced trauma life support skills, they adeptly rolled me onto my back, stabilized my C-spine, and called 911. It was my team's weekend to cover spine call. So a fellow PGY3 ortho resident had the unthinkable task of assessing me as I was rolled into the trauma bay. Apparently my years of befriending everyone in the hospital, from president to janitors, paid off. Because I was whisked from the trauma bay to imaging to the OR in record time. It was on the operating room table in under two hours. Another friend of mine was the attending surgeon who performed my anterior cervical decompression infusion to stabilize my spine my first of three surgeries. I had suffered a C6 teardrop fracture and initially was unable to move or feel anything from my chest down. I had very minimal use of my upper extremities as well. I had some difficulty breathing and mustering enough strength to cough, but I was lucky enough to never require intubation outside of the OR. In my attempts to describe spinal cord injuries to people, I sometimes talk about a highway system. The further the accident is from the brain, the more exits to other parts of the body that are still accessible. So I could hold my head up, my shoulders and my elbows worked, my lungs still worked, but my diaphragm was initially too weak for deep breaths. I didn't have the strength or dexterity in my hands, especially in my right hand, to pick up a pen or hold a fork and I couldn't feel or move my legs. People only think of motor and sensory losses when discussing paralysis. But I had also lost control of my bowel and bladder function. And I had no proprioceptive sense, which is your, ability, your body's ability to discern where it is in space. On July 15th, five days after my second surgery, a posterior spinal fusion, I was airlifted to the Rehab Institute of Chicago which is now the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab for my acute inpatient rehab. I was a terrible patient. As a third year ortho resident at the time, I knew, or thought I knew, just enough to be dangerous. And as a former All-American track athlete at Stanford, I was determined to regain my independence from this humbling state of helplessness. From my situation on the other side of the stethoscope, I wondered exactly why they needed that blood for lab work and waited very impatiently for answers. I realize now that it was in my attempt to hold on to what little control I felt I had left. I did multiple hours of physical and occupational therapy every day, learning to roll over on my own, to sit up in bed, to transfer from bed to chair, to catheterize myself and to manage my own bowel program. I spent entire hour-long therapy sessions trying to put on one sock, 
or thread my shoelaces into my shoe. Once I could tolerate being upright in a stander for 30 minutes, I was able to use a robotic gait training device called a locomat. By then, it had been over two months since my injury. And while I was very pleased with the gains I'd made, I still had not regained any motor function below my chest. Then suddenly on September 8th, when I was alone in my bathroom at RIC, I suddenly moved my legs for the first time. That drastically changed the trajectory of my rehab, and I was able to begin working on gait therapy. My parents remodeled our home in South Bend, Indiana to make it accessible, and I continued my rehab at Memorial Outpatient Therapy Services. I eventually took driver's rehab and learned to drive on my own using hand controls. In an effort to continue to exercise my mind while also exercising my body, I enrolled in a master's degree in engineering, science, and technology entrepreneurship at Notre Dame, which introduced me to research in the world of design, healthcare innovation, and technology, working to create a device to make pedicle screw placement in spine surgery more safe and efficient. That degree also led to the development of other medical devices, some of which I have used in my own rehab process. Even before I finished my master's, I was blessed with the opportunity to return to medicine and continue my training in family medicine at Memorial Hospital in South Bend, where I've had the privilege of delivering babies, returning to the operating room, and caring for patients from all walks of life, or roles. I was appointed by the mayor to the County Board of Health. I serve as the vice president of a nonprofit which oversees two adaptive sports. And I returned to Notre Dame as a thesis advisor for a master's student in that same master's program that I had completed. I wanted to continue pushing the envelope, so I hired a personal trainer at the hospital gym and transitioned out of conventional physical therapy. My trainer had no knowledge of what I should or shouldn't be able to do. And so he'd simply create workout plans, and we would then modify them based on how much additional stability or support I needed. This led me to do a six-week intense rehab program in Los Angeles, previously called Project Walk, now the Abilities Recovery Center, where I was also able to spend more time with my six-year-old son, Alexander. While I can't yet run around with him the way I'd originally thought I would with my children, I can use scooters, and other different types of mobility devices to keep up with him. Through my rehab, I was eventually able to achieve my goal of walking unassisted across a short room. However, the demands of fulfilling my residency requirements and the other things that I put on my plate have left me regressing in that area, something that I cannot let happen. In March of 2015, I lost my father, a well-respected, and loved neonatologist to suicide. While my own physical struggles were easy for others to see visibly, this highlighted for me the fact that not everyone's are. I have since considered myself a voice for those that don't have much of one and an advocate for individuals with disabilities, visible or otherwise. Come February, I will join the faculty at Michigan Medicine in the departments of family medicine, physical medicine and rehab, and the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. All of these roles advance my personal mission to disabuse disability. I still have significant physical limitations, but I refuse to let those hold me back, something I wish to impart on all my patients as well. I have learned the value of independence, and through my own injury and recovery, I now have the empathy for the struggle to achieve it. Thank you.